Looks like we're live. Good morning and welcome to Monday morning edition of Coffee with Rich. Of course, I'm your host and tour guide, Rich Brown, co-host, co-founder of the American Warrior Society mm. and the American Warrior Show, America's leading self-defense podcast. Today, I'm joined by none other than my brother, my actual baby brother, Jeff Brown. And uh, we've had Jeff on the show before. It was, what, like a year or so ago? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, we are going to have Jeff on for round two because he is in town for Thanksgiving. I think it would be, I'd be remiss not to have Jeff on the show because he has an impressive bio, and I will read it in just a second. But before I do, while we're waiting on Folks to jump on. Rudy is on. Good morning, Rudy. Will Parker is on from Montana. Uh, Scott is on. Good morning, Scott. He says, good morning, boys. Glad to have you on, Scott. Please like and hit that share button. Let's talk about sponsors real quick before I read Jeff's bio and get on to the day's show. We have amazing sponsors like Appalachian Standard, makers of the finest CBD products your money can possibly buy. If you've been thinking about trying CBD, you've heard some of the hype. Give it a give it a shot, guys. Give it a just try it for a month. Now remember the uh, CBD products from Appalachian Standard are full spectrum, which means you will pop positive on your analysis test. So if you're still taking your analysis test, I encourage you to try some of the other things that they have to offer, and maybe leave the tincture off your list because a couple of drops under your tongue, although it's going to help you sleep better. It's going to help you think better. It's going to help your joints feel better. I will ca caution you that you will uh, pop positive for your analysis test because it is full spectrum. There is trace amounts of THC, but they also have salves, et cetera. So please check them out. Like I said before, my lovely bride, Miss Lisa, she has uh, a tiny little vape that they produce with pumpkin spice CBD in it. A couple hits before she goes to bed and she sleeps incredibly well, I am told. So check them out at apphemp.com. Matter of fact, check out all of our sponsors this morning. The easiest way to do that is to go to American Warrior Show. And uh, on the right side of the page, you'll see links to all of our sponsors, as well as deep discount codes for watching this morning's show. Century Martial Arts Makers of the Bob XL. The Bob XL, the body opponent bag, extra long, is going to take your strike game to the next level. We also have Cool Fire Trainer. You've heard me say it before, folks. The Cool Fire Trainer, it's your gun. Your trigger, your sights, your grip panel, your everything. Because all you do is change out the barrel and the recoil spring and you get felt recoil. Why dry fire when you can cool fire? Please check out the Cool Fire Trainer. Uh, some of our, many of our guests are fire instructors and they say that using the Cool Fire Trainer makes them a better instructor because the student can actually feel the recoil before they actually go to live fire. So please check them out. Uh, let me know if everyone can hear my volume okay, because because we're going to be sharing a microphone, it's going to be a little bit uh, unusual this morning. Mountain Man Medical, makers of the co-branded trauma kit for the price of a dinner and a movie with your honey, you can get an amazing trauma kit to put in your vehicle, your home, your kid's college dorm room, etc. Mountain Man Medical, please check them out. Brian McLaughlin over there. And, and the rest of us here at the American Warrior Society put together this trauma kit. It has everything that you're going to need to keep your family and your loved ones safer. Precision Holsters. Precision Holsters is makers of the uh, Ultra Appendix rig that I'm wearing, as well as their tactical line of products. They also have a competition line if you're into that. And if you're watching the big circle or have been, you probably noticed that Mr. Rob Latham and Mike Seeklander are using the uh, Precision Holsters competition line. So that's about as good as an endorsement as I can think of. Let's see. I think we've covered them all, Jeff. Yes, we have. We are done. Sponsor reads. It's funny because uh, <clears throat> I've tried some of the CBD products uh, from Mountain Man Medical, and it was amazing. You know, I, CBD I, from Mountain Man Medical? I mean, uh, <clears throat> from uh, Appalachian Standard, ah. and uh, we had uh, – I've been traveling for a while and it was, it was nice to calm, uh, you know, anxiety and the, the, get the baggage off of me. It was pretty awesome. Good. Uh, and like I said, if, for those of you that are just tuning in, thank you to the 20 folks that are joining Jeff and I live. This is my brother, Jeff Brown. We had him on the show about a year ago. He's in town for Thanksgiving and I thought I'd be remiss if I didn't have my brother on the show. So he was kind enough to come on. Let's see who we got. 
Rudy, Will, Scott. Uh, Will Parker says, wow, we get to hear from Jeff. Tony is on. John is on from Yukon, Oklahoma. Brian Wall, good morning, Brian. Coin number 2031. If you want to know what a coin number is, you're going to have to check out the AmericanWarriorSociety.com and find out if becoming a coin member is the right thing for you. Walt is on, says, good morning, Jen. Skip says, good morning, Jeff, Rich, everyone else. Mark is on, on the road in Toronto, Canada. Good morning. Skip says, loud and clear. Good. Jesse is on. Good morning, Jesse. Coin number 2221. Glad to have you. Good. And uh, Z, am I pronouncing your name correctly? He's he's up there. It says, good morning from New York. Good morning, Z. Okay, so let's get into today's show. I'm going to read Jeff's bio here. I don't think we did that last time, so. It'll be interesting for those that don't know you, Jeff, to hear a little bit about your bio. Jeff joined the United States Marine Corps in 1992. He served eight years with the United States Marine Corps Reserve, Delta Company, 4th Combat Engineer Battalion in Knoxville, Tennessee, where he was a tactical vehicle operator, combat engineer, squad leader, etc. During that time, he also served as a corporal and special operations response team leader with the Knox County Sheriff's Department. Then in 2000, Jeff joined the United States Coast Guard. His first duty station was at Shinnecock Small Boat Station in New York, where he earned several new qualifications and functioned as the small boat coxswain, law enforcement officer, and fisheries officer. His primary duties included search and rescue, law enforcement, team training, and MDA. What is MDA? Uh, the <clears throat> Marine uh, Domain Awareness. Marine Domain Awareness. We'll get back into that. It was during that time that he deployed as a member of the safety and security team to New York City following the 9-11 terrorist attack. His next assignment was on the Tahoma. On the Tahoma, he was a small boat coxswain and cutter over the horizon coxswain, where he conducted interdictions autonomous of the cutter itself. He served as their primary law enforcement officer for conducting migrant, narcotics, and fisheries, etc. Jeff's next assignment took him to the International Training Division where he was assigned as the International Law Enforcement Instructor. While there, he taught over in over 36 countries teaching maritime law enforcement, narcotics, terrorism, migrant issues, piracy, fisheries, et cetera, et cetera, and as well as offensive and defensive small boat tactics. Additionally, he conducted vulnerability and security assessments in ports and waterways around the world. The remainder of Jeff's impressive career involves maritime law enforcement assignments of increasing responsibility and complexity. Jeff's awards and certifications and achievements are too numerous to list here. However, he recently received his 100-ton captain's license. Congrats, bro. Thank you. And he currently lives on a sailboat in Key West, Florida, and he's living the dream, folks. <laughs> Jeff, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for having me. What does your bio overlook? Uh, I'm the father of... Uh... Two great children. Uh, they currently live in Knoxville, Tennessee. They're living their own little dream up there. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just am very happy to live in America. I think a lot of people need to get outside the, the country. I was very fortunate to travel to mainly, if you would, third world countries. And, uh, you know, now that I'm out there, <clears throat> living my dream, it makes me uh, love it even more. Sweet. If there's any issues with the sound, let me know and we'll definitely adjust. But because uh, we just kind of, uh, I'm not sure that this is working well, but I, I, hopefully it is. Everybody can hear okay. Hey, what what advice would, uh, well, let, let's back up. So you were in the Marine Corps and the Coast Guard. Tell me a little bit about why you joined the Marine Corps, what some of the lessons it taught you, and then we'll transition. Talk to me about uh, the transition from the Marine Corps to the Coast Guard, some of the differences, because most people have never served their country in uniform. I mean, like, what is it, 98, 99% of Americans have never worn the uniform, So, uh, let alone served in two branches. So tell us about those different branches, Jeff. Well, you know, you had already joined the Marine Corps. Uh, we had had a very lengthy discussion about that, you know, before you even joined. I was still in high school. So once I had joined, uh, it was it was primarily I wanted to be one of the, you know, the few, the proud. And uh, it was 
it was more of a challenge to myself, you know, that if if I can if I can make it through Marine Corps boot camp, I can pretty much accomplish anything. And uh, you know, I set that as a goal and went after that. Uh boot camp was boot camp, you know. It uh you know, having watched you graduate and know that, you know, our uncle before us had had been there, walked on that same parade field and, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, was killed in Vietnam, you know, it was, you know, and then thinking about all the people that had come through there, it was, it was unique to, uh, to my life. I mean, it changed me in ways that I can't even imagine. Um, but I learned a lot of discipline and just, how to overcome adversity in my life, you know, in, in ways that I hadn't previously understood the uh, leadership aspect and, uh, you know, troop development and, you know, being able to uh, take a group of people as I, you know, increased in rank, you know, and have them do things that most people would not even consider being able to accomplish. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a really good video, a bunch of Marines flipping a giant truck over, you know, with just ropes. Uh, and it's like, you know, they're like, you can have lunch right after you get this truck flipped over and they're out there just heaving lines, flip this truck over. It's, it, it was pretty amazing, but to be able to do things that most other people, you know, look at and go, wow, that's, that's freaking impressive. And then I got, you know, uh, I got this desire to be on the water. You know, I, I was very fortunate in my time in the Marine Corps, uh, going through amphib school out in uh, Coronado, uh, doing small book stuff out there. And just being on the water, is, uh, it just kept calling to me. And I started researching, you know, what can I do, you know, in the water when you went to jungle warfare school in Panama too, didn't you? Yes, absolutely. And we were, you know, patrolling up the Rio Chagres. It was shortly after just cause had, had happened. So Panama was kind of in this, uh, transition from Ashton Noriega to, you know, becoming their own new democracy. It was, uh, and you know, we did small boat operations there and that was kind of my first experience outside of the United States and seeing what another country looked like. So, uh, but, you know, I, I got this harebrained idea that I wanted to be on the water and I saw a documentary about the Coast Guard and I was like, wow, that's pretty, pretty awesome. But I had no idea anything about the Coast Guard. I, had, I, I walked in, I was like, I want to be on the water, sign me up. I want to, you know, so, uh, unfortunately, since I had done my full eight years in the Marine Corps, it was contract was over. So I had to go back through Coast Guard full boot camp. This was pre 9 11, so they wasn't taking prior service or anything. So uh, I had to go back through another boot camp. And uh, I'll pause right there because I, I want to hear the juxtaposition between the two. Ken is on. It says, good morning, coin number 1771. Good morning, Ken. So just for just for the record, Jeff is my younger brother. Jeff's almost three years younger than me. See, you can see who <laughs> our, our Brown family, man, everybody goes gray by like 30. It is a serious premature gray gene. And as you can see, it skipped me and Jeff got a double dose of it. Yeah. But to, to Jesse's point, he says that, uh, Jeff's beard took my, puts mine to shame. So yeah. Guile from the Philippines is on. He says, good morning, Rich. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, everybody. Thank you to the 19 folks joining us live. Please like and hit that share button. So Jeff, you were saying that you went through Marine Corps boot camp. You'd served in the Marines for eight years. During that time, you were with the Knox County Sheriff's Department. You were a corporal uh, working there at the corrections facility. You were a special operations team leader. And now... The Coast Guard tells you, hey, pal, you've been out of boot camp for eight years. Time to go back. What was that like? Well, you know, because 
you know, the, the sheriff's department, uh, the academy that we went through, you know, was, uh, was interesting. So I almost consider that a little boot camp ish. And then uh, the special operations response team, uh, their in doc was pretty uh, intensive, uh, as you well know. And then uh, going to another boot camp, you know, it, the first couple of days were uh, <laughs> like, what have I done? <laughs> You know, uh, here I am. I was about 28 years old at the time, and I'm getting yelled at by these people. And it's like, you're not going to make me march any straighter or stand any taller than the Marine Corps ha has has molded me. And uh, you know, we had uh, some of the company commanders. We call them company commanders in uh, in the Coast Guard, not drill instructors or anything like that, but. Uh, you know, you hear stories of, well, Coast Guard is, you know, one of the most difficult boot camps next to the Marine Corps. So I was very intrigued with that, that thought process. And uh, going in there, the demand is, because the job set is different. And that was what was very difficult to me was how they do it. And, you know, I knew all the games and everything that the company commanders were going to play. So it was it was not that difficult for me personally. And I kind of took it upon myself to help out some of the junior members, some of these 18 year olds that have first time <clears throat> away from home. And, uh, you know, it, it it helped me to shine, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It. It is a mental, more mentally challenging uh, in the knowledge base for Coast Guard graduates because they want you to know like everything that to how to run a boat, you know, like helm commands, lines, like um, whereas like in the Marine Corps, you know that you've got Marine combat training or school of infantry, you know, your actual MOS trainings coming later, which we do in the Coast Guard as well. But when you leave Coast Guard boot camp, there's an expectation that we're putting you on a little small boat and you need to know everything. And that's kind of the same mentality sounds like with the Marine Corps, like every Marine's a rifleman. That that's the at least that's the tagline, right? Every Marine's a rifleman. So it sounds like their kind of expectation is that every person graduating coast guard boot camp should be able to function on a boat right absolutely yeah. okay so uh bill knofsinger's on good morning brother semper five we were in delta company together with bill hey, hey bill gal says uh jeff brown great seeing you finally uh, dr gordon bodson is on up in ohio coin number 1688 my lovely bride miss lisa is on and uh gal and lisa are wishing happy thanksgiving to everyone thank you to the 20 folks joining us so uh, when you graduated uh, Coast Guard boot camp, you invited me to come up and I got to hand you, I believe, a plaque for being one of the honor grads at a boot camp, right? Yes. Congrats. Nah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So again, one of, many, one of just many accomplishments. So after that, you go to Shinnecock and begin your career in maritime law enforcement. I think you were a bosun at first, but you went on to that. So what was the transition from like well let me ask you this i want to i want to get to some of your stuff but what was transitioning out of the coast guard like you finally you served what from 19 1992 when you joined the marine corps until when did you retire uh january 1 2020 january 1 of 2020 so you spent over 28 years in service to your country what was that like finally getting to grow a beard and being free <laughs> well you know when, when I was with the International Training Division, we had relaxed grooming standards in some of the countries, so I was able to grow a, a beard sometimes and grow my hair a little longer out of regs. Uh, but to finally just wake up and say, I'm not shaving, <laughs> was like, you know, this has been trimmed a couple of times over, over the last uh, 
Yeah. Almost two years. I've always said this. Don't get into a beard growing contest with Jeff. He can grow one of these beers in a day and a half. It's, just, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, some of the, some of the people that might be watching today uh, that I uh, served with at the international training division, some of the people that were in there could not grow a beard and they'd be like, all right, y'all can grow a beard, you know, let it grow for a week. And I would walk in on Friday and they're like, no way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But uh, the the differing jobs of the the Coast Guard that made it a little, you know, I got called into the commanding officer's office numerous times saying, Jeff, this is not the Marine Corps. This will never be the Marine Corps. Stop trying to make it the Marine Corps. Because I still had that mentality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and to put it kind of bluntly, you know, the Marine Corps is teaching you to tell some young guy to run at a machine gun nest, you know, without question. And the Coast Guard wants you to tell that guy that we're going to go out into harm's way, but what's your opinion of it? You know, uh, in case there's a safety overlook, you know, and, and, and unfortunately, you know, or, or fortunately, I had experiences where a junior person was like, he saw something that I didn't see. And, you know, I was able to take that into account and we had a successful mission because this junior member spoke up and. And let's talk about some of your missions because this is something that you don't hear a lot of podcasts about. And that is coast guards going out at sea over the horizon, perhaps from their own cutter and conducting boarding operations. What, what was that like? Well, the, uh, some of the larger ships have the over the horizon or OTH vessel and it can be deployed. You know, it has a range of over 300 nautical miles. Uh, you know, so the ship can be blacked out, you know, miles away and uh, we can deploy the, the over the horizon, you know, with a small, you know, tactical team run out and sneak in around, uh, you know, whether it be a, a vessel hauling migrants, uh, or a narcotic boat, uh, the narcotics coming up through, you know, from Colombia or shooting across from Mexico or migrants coming across, uh, you know, and it just, it elevates our tactical concepts. Uh, you know, we've had war games out there with some of the other, uh, militaries from Dutch, French, and, uh, you know, because we had our OTH capability, we were able to encompass the entire scope of the, the mock battlefield, you know, and be able to relay information to the, to our cutter and give them positions and stuff like that. So, um, and because, a lot of your work was done in West Africa and uh, the Caribbean. The Coast Guard sent you to French language school. We, oui. <laughs> yeah, je suis uh, débutant et cours de français. And how was that? Uh, it was very humorous because, you know, as you can tell, I have a uh, slight hickish twang and speaking the language of love, you know. But, you know, the French immersion school that I went through, it was a uh, three month long you know, fully immersed in, in the French language and culture. But then with the expectation that I was going to go to Port-au-Prince and speak to uh, the Haitians down there or West Africa, Sierra Leone or whatever. And the, you know, my translations of, you know, I, I speak French fairly well or did. And then going down there and they speak a, totally different dialect. So the, the, the program, I was kind of a test bed for this new, uh, uh, department of Homeland security language school. And I had to write a report about it and it was not, it was not what we needed. The, the Creole language that they speak in those in those countries, just, it, it didn't fit our need. So you're saying when you, when you got to Haiti and you started, uh, laying the, the language of love down. It didn't always translate well. <laughs> no, not at all. So I know that um, you went to uh, 
firearms instructor school for like four weeks to become a federal firearms instructor, correct? Yes. So in your opinion, I've asked this of all the guys and gals that have been on here that are uh, firearms instructor. What makes a good instructor in your opinion? And, and I've, I've watched almost every podcast and I've heard almost every instructor and, and every one of them have, have, have great uh, opinions. Uh, we were transitioning when I went through firearm school, we were transitioning from the Beretta to the new SIGs, um, the 229 and we were having failure rates of uh our officers because you know unfortunately somebody in washington was like yep this is the, this is the gun we need you know without talking to the actual people that are carrying these and uh so it was it was a difficult transition for us so it was my competency level to teach had to be way higher than previously expect expected with the, with the the new firearms and everything else so an understanding of basic firearm safety uh you know going from an external safety to you know uh, uh striker fire weapons and stuff like that safety I, i've seen too many accidents we had uh, one of our instructors uh at the range with us and you know there was a, a ricochet and it you know there, there was some bad situations and it was all because of the basic safety hmm. and i think that safety to me is is as as important as as anything when it comes to uh, being a firearms instructor. Okay. That, that makes sense. I haven't heard anybody say that. Uh, Matt is asking a question. Good morning, Matt. He says, what's your favorite boarding weapon? When you were boarding vessels, what, what did you normally carry and why? Uh, blunderbuss. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> the, uh, well, we recently transitioned from regular because we were using old Marine Corps M sixteen A twos for years. You know, we got the bottom of the barrel. You know, whatever was, you know, left over, give it to the Coast Guard. So we were, our firearms were. You know, we had old Beretta nine millimeters that the Marine Corps had just. You know, sometimes. You know, we had to double check like our M16A2s because there would be no riflings left in them. Oh, God. Yeah. Because uh, they were literally like the Marine Corps was like, okay, these are broke. You know, they would we, they would wind up in our possession. Uh, when I would do boardings, normally I did not carry any kind of long gun. You know, we had. Uh, so you're carrying a pistol only. Yeah, we, we had 870 uh, Remingtons and M16A2s uh, on our boardings with us. But for me personally, I was always just carrying a, a Beretta 9mm. Was that because you were leading the boarding team or that's just how you roll? That, that's, that's what I, you know, as the boarding officer. Okay. Uh, when I first joined the Coast Guard, they, they, the Coast Guard has primary law enforcement officers, which are your boarding officers, but we have boarding team members also who are junior members that are, uh, they're not actual non-commissioned officers. So they cannot do law enforcement. They cannot uh, arrest or search seize. They can't do, their mainly job is security of the boarding team. So their, their position as a boarding team member is usually carry the long gun, stand there. So on Star Trek, they'd be the red shirts that die yeah. on every single one. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, because as the as the actual primary boarding officer, I'd usually had the paperwork. I would have an assistant boarding officer that would you know fill out the paperwork for me while I'm conducting you know the actual boarding itself. And depending, obviously, on, you know, are we doing a fisheries boarding? You know, we do recreational boardings and, you know, non-compliant boardings where we actually have to go and, like, 
take the ship over basically. Uh, so <clears throat> that answer your question. Uh, yeah, know, I, yes, I, it does. I, I, you know, I, I didn't carry like a cool sword a or battle anything. axe. Or yeah. anything. <laughs> so uh, tell me about mindset. And I, I asked that of a lot of my guests yeah. and I think it's an interesting question. I pose it to you because knowing about, you know, your background, we were both on the special operations team of the sheriff's department. Um, you know, you're going in, you might have to take down a pod of inmates of, I think I've gone in a pod with as little as four officers and we're, you know, we're blacked out with ball and clavas and taken over 48 hardened criminals, everything from that to boarding a vessel at sea where, you know, it's maybe migrants that this is their one chance at freedom, how they're going to behave. So I ask that of you specifically because you're, you have a lot of experience with that or going into a, one of the 36 countries you visited with the international training team and dealing with people that are like, man, what are these guys going to teach me? What can they possibly teach me in Montenegro or Azerbaijan or, or Latvia or any of the places you've been? So I want to talk to you about mindset. How do you create it? How do you maintain it? How does age and experience affect it? So wherever you want to take it. I was somewhat fortunate growing up. Uh, you know, and you know my background of my childhood. Uh, you know, I was kind of a free free range kid. And, uh, you know, I got to experience a lot of interesting things and meet a lot of interesting people in my uh, youth. So as I transitioned through the years and my experiences with the with the Marine Corps, with the Sheriff's Department and dealing with, uh, you know, especially in the Sheriff's Department, that was so eye opening. I, 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 I personally think that, you know, every police officer should spend at least a minimum of one year in, in corrections. Uh, I learned more about the criminal mindset, uh, what they're capable of, their communication standards. Uh, that was one of the one of the biggest things to me was understanding just how complex a criminal mind is. And I worked in a maximum security unit. So these guys were looking at life in jail with zero, you know, care in the world. So as as I dealt with them, my mindset had to change from, you know, always being the friendly guy. And, you know, I, I like to joke around a lot. You know, it's kind of one of the ways I deal with stresses. You know, I'll make a joke about something in inappropriate times. <laughs> uh, but getting in there and because if you don't have the proper mindset, they can pick it up. Oh, yeah faster than anybody in this world. I'm, uh, you know, I've met used car salesmen that were almost as, as quick to judge people, but, uh, working in around those type of individuals in a maximum security setting, you know, if, if you didn't stand up for yourself, you were, you were done. Yeah. And I watched people come and go that with the thought of, yeah, I could do this. And, you know, within a week, you know, they're crying in the, in the supervisor's office and they're gone. Yeah. Uh, but as I moved through the Coast Guard and witnessed more and more tragedy and uh, started traveling to these foreign countries, you know, getting in there and, and like we embedded and lived with our students you know, on, on a daily basis. So we experienced, we ate what they ate. We, you know, uh, we did mock missions with them. We went out with them on, on, on different things. So being able to do that and see how they conduct themselves with sometimes even more limited resources than I could even possibly fathom, uh, boats with holes in them, literally like sinking as we're running around the, the bay and stuff like that. Um, it, it taught me 
how to achieve more with less. I think that I took that as part of my mindset of, you know, when I'm walking down the street, I'm constantly looking at what little thing that I can use to my advantage later on. Mm. So if I walk past a stick, I know where that stick is and, you know, something happens. I know, you know, get that stick because I, <laughs> I, I saw it and I equate it to my lifestyle. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. <clears throat> we, uh, when you're talking about more with less, I, I was thinking about, you know, obviously with the Marine Corps is that way. And I, I took that into when I was with the Red Cross, you know, we're a nonprofit, so we don't have deep pockets. Every dollar we spend is a donated dollar. So being a good steward of that money. But one of the things that you told me at one point was, I think you were in El Salvador one week and maybe Nicaragua not too long after that, or I might be confusing the countries. And they were kind of skirmishing with each other and, one one week you're on the you know receiving end of gunfire from the group you're with, and then is that? Tell me about that. Yeah, that was. Uh, and El Salvador was very interesting. I I, I taught in El Salvador, Nicaragua. Uh, we were in Nicaragua, you know, when the Sandinistas took back over, waving the flag with Hugo Chavez, you know, waving at me at the airport. And uh, but it, it, if I may. Um, when I was in El, <clears throat> El Salvador, we were working with one of their special forces down there that does like the MS-13 gang roundups down in uh, El Salvador. And we're out there training and I pulled them aside and I was like, I just out of curiosity, what is the main smuggled thing coming through El Salvador? And they looked at me and I'm thinking, you know, human trafficking, drugs, you know, what, what is it? Cocaine, marijuana. And he said, cheese. And, um, so in Honduras and Nicaragua, they can make cheese. They don't have the health standards at El Salvador because El Salvador imports to us. So they'll make this huge bats of cheese in these countries, bring them into El Salvador where they get over 150, 200% markup and, <laughs> you know, but it was, it was just funny, but you know, that that's very similar to Montenegro and Albania. You know, we, one, one month I'm in Montenegro teaching the next month I'm in Albania and they have a, a large lake that separates them and, and the drug running and weapons running, Everything from, you know, when cigarettes go cheap in Montenegro, they're running across the border on this huge lake to bring the cheap cigarettes to Albania. And then, you know, a couple of months will go by and then it'll be the exact opposite. And uh, so one minute, you know, I'm working with the, the police in Albania. The next month I'm working in Montenegro with and and they're always kind of clashing as to where's the line on the lake. Mm. Um, and that that's one of the great things about the Coast Guard not being a Department of Defense. You know, we can go into these countries and it not be considered an act of war or anything like that. But in El, in El Salvador, we're out patrolling with the with the El Salvador Marines and, you know, the Hondurans are out there firing freaking 50 cows you know, from, from over the freaking bay to, to our little, you know, we had some old Vietnam era river boats that we were running down there. And, you know, it, it's just a whole nother, another world. I want to circle back to mindset because when I asked you about it, you said you referenced learning about the criminal mind when you were with the sheriff's department, because, you know, we had serial killers in there. And, you know, talking to them is like, wow, they don't, to quote Dr. William April, they don't think like us. So how was that beneficial for you for the re remainder of your professional life? And what can the average person watching today, what can they take away from that? What, what lesson can you give them about that? Well, we had numerous serial killers and numerous, uh, 
we had some justified homicide people that just could not post bail. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was a don't judge a book by its cover was a lot of, you know, you walk down through a, through the, the jail cells and, and you're talking to these individuals. Some of them were some of the most highly intelligent people that you could talk to. They're articulate and it's the guy next door type of person. Some of them, it's like, well, this is guys obviously has a mental issue. Uh, you know, but I saw a lot of things that made me question because I, I always thought I was pretty good at telling who's guilty, mm -hmm. you know, walk through and go, look at that guy. He's that's, that's a criminal right there. And then getting in there and realizing that the guy that I'm usually pointing at as a criminal isn't always the case, you know, that, uh, beware of the guy that's patting you on the back, uh, looking for the soft spot in your armor kind of mentality and, uh, the manipulation. I, I question a lot more now just because somebody says it's fact, it's kind of led me to, to question a lot more things, you know, just because somebody said, man, I ain't got nothing on me, you know, and, and you look them over first, first glance, you would think, no, they, they, that guy looks good. He, he looks like he's, he has nothing on him. Well, little did you know, you know, he's got every type of blade known to mankind, you know, uh, yeah, secured in his person. Yeah. And that's, that's something, you know, you, you watch these videos and you hear the man, I didn't do nothing kind of a mantra coming from people as they're being arrested and 99.98% .9 of the time, that's absolute BS. They did do something obviously, but, and, and oh, once you get in the correction setting to Jeff's point, they may not think like us, but many of them look like us deceptively. So, and the biggest mistake you can probably make is to assume about somebody. You know, if you want to assume, assume the worst, uh, and you'll rarely be disappointed. Donald Green is on this morning from Liberated Virginia. Good morning, sir. Glad to have you. Coin number 1376. If you want to find out what a coin number is, please uh, check out the American Warrior Society.com. Will Parker says, Jeff, were you the Coast Guardsman who jumped on the drug sub and pounded on the hatch? <laughs> that is a negative. That was not me. We have a uh, the Coast Guard Maritime uh, Special Forces team that goes out. They they just started deploying them on cutters and stuff to do uh, takedowns of vessels and counterterrorism. Uh, they are a you know a, a tiered unit. Uh, they the the stuff that the Coast Guard is doing kind of behind the scenes, people have no clue uh, a lot of times because they don't, they're not really getting the attention. You know, their, their missions are, you know, like very subdued and not really like shown on television. They haven't reached the status of some of the, other special special operations, special forces units within the U S government, uh, yet. Uh, but that guy, if you see a coast guard guy and, and that type of camouflage, uh, he's a member of one of the special operations, special forces teams of, of the coast guard maritime security response teams. And we have different, we have Mar maritime security, uh, response teams that are, fully special forces. Then we have some offsets, MSSTs is what we call them, maritime uh, safety and security teams. Uh, they, they run around in like black boats around harbors and stuff like that. They do the uh, nuclear sub security and things of that nature. But uh, that team is a, a very impressive uh, bunch of guys and gals. The, it's very difficult to get into that.
I was going to say that that right there was probably the best recruiting advertisement I saw for the Coast Guard. If I'd been <clears throat> 19 and saw that, I'd be like, yeah, you need to sign me up for that. Jumping onto a, a, a sub and banging on a hatch with a hammer. Yeah, I'm, I'm on board with that. Um, so let's get to the next question, Jeff. And if you got a question for Jeff, uh, please throw them up there. We talked about mindset, and I want to switch gears just a second. Let's talk about uh, – I want to talk about Rittenhouse in context of where all this lawlessness is going because, you know, last night – I think it was last night – we had an SUV yes. slam into a c crowd of people at a Christmas festival, and it seems like people are doing things that are just – you would never see. I mean, we're 50-ish we're so it's like we, we, we think we've been around the world a little bit, but yet we're seeing just senseless acts of violence routinely happen that we would, you just didn't necessarily see back in the day. Where's all this going, man? That's a good question. Uh, you know, we've, we've talked at length over the last several years about, you know, the escalation, you know, and my hope and desire is that, and we've talked about this, about the pendulum swinging back. You know, it, it can only go so far, you know, and if it goes farther, the pendulum breaks off of the, the clock. So, you know, the, the hope that I have is that the pendulum will start swinging back and people are going to be like, I, I'm done with this, you know, and standing up for their cells and standing up for their communities. And I think we saw that with Kyle Rittenhouse. You know, he's been watching – you know, the same stuff that we're watching and on a on a nearly daily basis, you know, the the, the looting and the rioting and the, the fires being set, you know, and and at what point do average citizens say enough is enough? You know, you know, the, the fact that they tried to uh, make him into this evil entity and it's like what? Okay, show me pictures of Kyle Rittenhouse the days leading up to that. What was, what was he doing? Scrubbing and, and cleaning up graffiti and picking up trash and because he cared about his community. And what point do, you know, private citizens down the street just say, enough is enough. I'm not going to let this happen. And, you know, because it just bleeds over into the next community and it it grows, you know, like mold on bread. It's It's... Yeah, and of course, Manhar, uh, during the riots, the, the very deadly riots in South Africa, it's a similar situation, right? Because you had the law enforcement elements pulling out and leaving the people to, their, to, to fend for themselves. And if you live in that area where the law enforcement pulls out, what are you supposed to do? Um, and like in, in South Africa specifically, you would have a group that would go in in advance of the mob and cut off the power, cut off the water so that nobody could put up the flames. And then they would burn tires there at that mall. And that was a signal that, okay, the supply lines have been cut. The roads have been blocked off. The water lines have been cut. Come on in and have a field day. So when law enforcement or more specifically the elected leadership that, uh, compels the law enforcement to do what they do says, Hey, between eighth street and 29th street, pull out. Don't, don't even go there. No, no calls for service in that community. We're, we're just going to pull back, do a tactical pause, whatever little sexy word they want to use. You're, you're going to create a scenario where uh, Americans, good Americans are like, man, I, I, I can't let my wife and family burn to death. And one of the things that bother me, Jeff, and I'll ask you about this, during this whole issue with the prosecution of Kyle Rittenhouse and Kyle Rittenhouse misguided as he may have been made a million tactical mistakes. I get it. You know, the, the, we could go on and on about that, but I, I'm that's not really talking about that right now. I think he's trying to do the right thing and he made a lot of mistakes. And I hope that what happened to him getting drunk through the mud is a, an example to everybody, but the prosecution kept, on him like it's just a dumpster fire right it's just a dumpster fire what why i have to run around and put out these dumpster fires well, dumpsters have wheels on them. once you start this thing on fire you can take it wherever you want take it to an apartment and burn the com apartment complex down so i say all that because um 
there's a lot to learn about. And I hope the elected leadership in this country is watching when you pull out of a community, you leave it up to uh, armed men to have to go in and do some of the roles that EMS, fire, and law enforcement does. Am I o missing or overstating that at all? You know what? We talked about it the other day about, you know, the defund the police. Well, this is what it looks like. It looks like Cal Rittenhouse, you know, John Smith, John Q. Public walking down the street with a rifle defending what's his. Um, that's what defund the police looks like. But Kyle Rittenhouse, but Kyle Rittenhouse crossed state lines. I mean, he he crossed state lines, and somebody po pointed out that on a map, like he went a mile to cross the state line. Uh, so it, it, let's let's calm down the rhetoric. And I would also say that who cares? I have every right to go anywhere in this country I want to go. Yeah. Uh, it, so that makes no sense to me. And if we're gonna punish kids for scrubbing graffiti or carrying a medic bag or a fire extinguisher because nobody else is willing to do go into harm's way and do that then, then what's next and uh tony says ender bronca is putting together a proposed kyle's law <clears throat> i saw some of that in my email this morning i haven't read it but i like it and i if i correct me if i'm wrong tony but i think the gist of it is it's to punish politically motivated prosecution is that correct and if so, I love that because somebody has to rein in these politically motivated prosecutions. Uh, for as awful as that was, you know, you know, like Anthony Huber, set aside the fact that Jump Kick Man, Rosenbaum, Huber, and Grosskwitz or whatever his name was, all, I think all of them had either been charged with or convicted of felonies crimes, right? Yes, the Jump it, Kick Man as well. It's somewhat, who cares? Because the actions that they did that night is what got them in the position they were in. And like Anthony Huber, let's say you're running down the street, you're out past curfew. Somebody screams out, he's got a rifle. He just shot some people. You go and try to hit him with a skateboard to take the rifle away. You think you're doing the right thing. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. And of course he gets shot in the chest and killed because third party defense is incredibly complex. What you think this looks clear cut. It may not be. So, uh, you know, third party defense is always a slippery slope. Tony says, correct. Holding the state and prosecutor personally responsible. Skip says former Norfolk, former Norfolk police Lieutenant Billy Kelly was fired by the black chief for donating 25 bucks for Kyle. Then the media makes officer Kelly out to be a racist. When in reality, if anyone is a racist, it's the black chief. It's civil blackmail. Yeah, these are morally complex times, and I think that that's part of what got Kyle in trouble. 17-year-old kid, not a whole lot of life experience, certainly never been trained to carry a rifle in that kind of environment, which is part of the problem, right? I mean, but let's, let's talk about, and this is where I have problems with combat vets. I did a whole video on the combat vets that are talking about Kyle's use of force, and I, I actually ran it for about six or seven minutes. I didn't publish it, post it anywhere because I'm like, eh, who cares? But since we're having this conversation, Jeff, and I want your opinion on it too, is watch the shooting again there, combat vet that has a lot to say about it, Kyle's use of force. If you want to talk about Kyle's tactics, please, I'll high five you. There's a lot of mistakes. If you want to talk about Kyle's, why is he there as a young man? And we could talk about all that. But as far as use of force, Man, I tell you what, I saw a Fox company one time light up a sedan carrying four civilians in it, and they fired hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of tows, AT4s, law rockets, five, you know, 5.56, five, God knows how much that, to, to stop one fleeing vehicle full of civilians, oops, turned out they shouldn't have shot them. But my point is, Kyle Rittenhouse, a lot of times, was firing one to two rounds and stopping the threat. He muzzles a guy, puts a muzzle down. You know, it's when the when the guy with the Glock gross quits or whatever his name starts to aim it at him, he raises the muzzle up. He takes the muzzle off of him, puts a, his muzzle down. He circles around with the Glock. Kyle fires one round. I mean, this is very judicious use of force. And if anybody, uh, I'd love to see in the comments 
uh, what your thoughts are, but I would challenge the combat vets that are out there, uh, you know, really complaining about Kyle's use of force. Go back and watch the video again. Slow it down if you have to. You know, Huber is, you can see the single point sling tugging at his clothing as Anthony Huber is trying to rip that rifle off his chest and he fires one round. Doesn't do a mag dump. Doesn't needlessly muzzle the crowd. And after he's used his uh, level of force, hands go in the air and he jogs toward the police. And this is a kid that's been struck in the head with a rock. He didn't muzzle the crowd, didn't indiscriminately fire. He gets struck in the head by a skateboard. Doesn't indiscriminately fire, doesn't muzzle the crowd. And then he gets hit again on the ground. as oh, Jump kick man kicks him in the face. He fires two rounds, misses. You want to talk about his... Uh, you know, his inability to hit a target that close, that's something we can discuss. But not the use of force, I don't personally think. What are your thoughts, Jeff? When, when I first saw it, I was pretty amazed at the fact that I, I assumed this kid was going to run out and honestly fire up into the air to do a, like a crowd disbursement. You know, just fire up into the air, get everybody away from him so he could clear his path. That didn't happen. You know, unfortunately, in in a situation like that, it's like, what would I have done? You know, if, if somebody was like, that guy just shot somebody, you know, and I see an opportunity, you know, I'm not a felon out there burning the city down, but Jeff Brown, as, as, a, as an individual, if I saw some person running down the street and everybody's screaming, he just shot somebody, what would I have done? You know, so... You know, would I have sat back and waited to see if there was more aggression that could potentially come to me? So there, there, there was an aspect of, you know, wow, you know, are these people actually acting as heroes? And as the prosecution uh, interviewed Kyle and everybody that witnessed it, you know, obviously my thought processes changed over, uh, you know, and that they were talking about, you know, a lot of the evidence that, and they were building the case for Kyle as, as the prosecution was talking, you know, and every witness that, you know, spoke, I, I, I think that the, the, the jury deliberation was one of my key takeaways uh, from the whole thing personally, but back to your, to your point, the, the, the tactical aspect of his movement down the street and, <clears throat> you know, he had a, a, he was purposely moving. Like he, he was heading in the direction of the law enforcement with every intention of, of giving himself up. <clears throat> and as the t attacks kept unfolding, you know, the fact that jump kick man was able to walk away was, you know, if, if he had turned one more split second to, to get another hit in or anything, then we would have been looking at, you know, more fatalities. Yeah. When I interviewed Andrew Bronco on the show, you know, uh, one of the things that he uh, brought up was in reference to jump kick, man. Well, let me, let me back up the whole idea that jump kick man's identity was held a secret by the prosecution until after it was over was also problematic. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but let's see here. Will Parker says as a student of the use of force, I'm amazed by Kyle's restraint. And then skip goes on to say, Kyle did perfect. In my opinion, he retreated until he was stopped by his attackers. I've seen career law enforcement officers not react as well as Kyle did. And all you have to do is turn on your thing and you can see, and I'm okay with a mag dump. If it takes a mag dump to stop the threat, then then by, by all means, you know, do a reload. I don't have a problem with that. My, I guess my point is one shot, stop the threat. He fired one shot. And so I, the level of restraint is incredible for a person of his age. And also like your point was moving toward the, the law enforcement line, even when he, before Rosenbaum attacked him, running into it with a fire extinguisher saying friendly, 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 friendly. I mean, how, you can't mistake his intent, you know? Okay. Yeah. He's got an AR swinging by a single point sling. I don't give a crap. He's got a medic bag. His hands are raised fire extinguisher, friendly, friendly, friendly. But I think part of the reason people were attacking him was he was stopping their felonious activity, right? He was stopping their arson. 
Yep. Yeah, Matt says great show, guys. Matt and, and Matt's a uh, a professional shooter and law enforcement officer. Matt, I'd love to uh, have your thoughts on that. Whether his use of force you felt was appropriate and judicious. Not talking about should he could he been there as a seventeen year old kid. Was he out past curfew? All this other kind of stuff. I, I understand that. There, I, I have problems with all of it. But we're talking about use of force only. Uh, was the level of use of force appropriate or not? And while we're waiting for other folks to chime in on that, uh, let's get to another. What is your everyday carry, Jeff, currently? And tell us a little bit about you know, what folks can do to make themselves harder to kill. My everyday carry right now, I carry the uh, SIG 365. Uh, I, I like it's compact. Uh the slender frame and everything, but still, you know, a more high capacity uh, magazine capability that it that it has. Uh, the, um, the the way it cycles and everything in my hand, it just it feels way more comfortable to me, you know, with the the, the slimmer hand grips. But uh, being harder to kill is, you know, knock on wood, you know. I've, been successful for almost 50 years now and I have put myself into positions where you know it it could have been unfavorable uh, of an outcome you know I, I have encountered you know idiots on the range and that's one of my reasons for my comment about safety you know as you know I was one time some knucklehead with a gun you know joking around, pointed at me, shot and parted my hair, literally. Um, so I, I, I take firearm safety extensively. You know, it, it's, it's, it is one of the key things I, you know, and that's when, when the prosecutor, you know, standing there facing the jury with a, you know, the, with the uh, AR style rifle, you know, finger on the trigger, you know, with, with n obviously no, clue about weapon safety or uh functionalities it was uh it was disheartening but you know being hard to kill is all about training and i think one of your guests said it the other day he was talking about getting out there and giving yourself just a little snippet of reality just put yourself in just a situation to where you're you know, kind of approaching an edge of uncomfortability, you know, and then pull back and, and just see your reaction to certain, certain things. Uh, it's kind of like when I was a kid, if I wanted to jump a really big ramp, I wouldn't just go try to, you know, jump that big ramp. I would, you know, work my way up to the big ramp. So, you know, giving yourself the opportunity to experience uh, some type of stressors in your life, depending on what your life is consists of. I mean, you know, you here in, you know, on the Brown farm, your threats and, you know, life, uh, the things that you deal with on a daily basis are way different than what I deal with on a daily basis in Key West. Key West has very little, uh, major crime issues you know they have a, a murder there maybe once every decade or two so but petty theft is huge there you know and you know at what level when when i retired one of the things that happened i went down to the grocery store where i lived in virginia and i see these two young men come running out of the food line that i was at and I knew the manager, I knew, cause I had helped them escort some unruly people out just as Joe Citizen help out uh, with, uh, you know, mental health people and stuff like that until the law enforcement showed up. So I knew all the, the people that worked there and they come chasing out after these guys, you know, and they're like, you know, they, they, they just, they just robbed us or whatever. So I, initially was like, well, I, I need to insert myself into this situation. 
you know, and I was concealed, I was concealed carry and, and I came around the corner and I was like, where would, you know, where would they go? And I was like, using my knowledge of the criminal mindset, I was like, they would have come down here. And sure enough, I went down this little alley and there they were and pulled up on them and I was getting ready to say something or try to stop them. And I had to pause for a minute. I'm like, this ain't your job, Jeff. You know, they didn't kill nobody. It's just property. You know, if you go down and there's a scuffle, you've got to kick, you know, you're concealed carrying. And I just drove on down the alley and I went home. And, you know, I, unfortunately, a lot of people do try to insert themselves and get themselves into a situation. Just like that, uh, that one individual, the black gentleman at the mall, there was an active shooter and he went, he drew his, his, his own personal concealed carry and uh, was, you know, shot by the police because they thought he was the assailant. You know, he tried to insert himself to, to help the situation, but, you know, and, I, you know, trying to determine at what level do you insert yourself into a situation, you know, has become one of my forethoughts before I move into anything. It's, am I helping the situation? Am I hurting the situation? Should I just, you know, step back and, and let it play out or so? And really that's complex problems. You know, the, the defense of third party or <clears throat> interjecting yourself into things. And again, you see what happens to Kyle Rittenhouse. You, you do the, you do your self-defense right and you still get drunk through the mud and, and you're facing life in prison. So I think, uh, you know, Discretion is a better part of valor in that position you were in. And I think going on down the road is probably the right thing. Be a good witness. Get the descriptions, get the license plate, turn it all in to the manager and let them deal with it. Because, uh, you know, a couple of uh, hams that somebody's stealing isn't worth your life. It isn't worth their life. It isn't worth spending the rest of your life in jail. Uh, Tony says, stay out of the fight. Yeah, that that's exactly right. I think uh, it might have been Greg Elifritz that was talking about teaching a class one time and the scenario begins to play out <clears throat> in the student with his SIM gun on. As soon as it breaks out, he runs out of the, he runs out of the room. And I, if, I, if it's not Greg Elfers, I apologize, but I think this is an interesting way of looking at things. And he follows him and says, what are you doing, man? It's like, you didn't engage. He goes, exactly. This gun's for me. You know, it's not, and the scenario was a third party defense kind of thing. The gun is for me and my family. It's not for other people. And I thought that was an interesting way of looking at things. Skip says Daryl Brooks uh, was the black man, was the driver of the car that killed the people in Wisconsin Christmas parade. Um, yeah, I have not seen who the suspect was or what motivated him. And I'm I'm interested to see why I had hoped that the the Christmas parade thing was unfortunately some some elderly person whose foot hit the, the gas because i i saw that as a police officer matter of fact this one woman she did a hit and run she's a little old lady in the state of tennessee i can take her driver's license and give her a summons to go and she has to pass a driver's test again so i tell her ma'am you can't drive anymore you you've done this hit and run you didn't even know you struck somebody we're going to call you uh, some of your family members to come get you. I'm going to impound your car, seize your driver's license, et cetera. And the next thing you know, I get a call that there's been, um, I think it's 1145 that meant a, a traffic collision inside a parking lot. So I go down there and this little old lady who I took her driver's license from, she was coming to pick up the traffic report from her hit and run. She shouldn't have been driving. She borrowed somebody's car and crashed into the detective's car. I thought that I was probably thinking that was what happened, but it appears as though that uh Christmas parade may have been an, uh, I don't know if it's an act of terrorism or just. A, well, the, I, I saw the same thing Skip's talking about okay. this morning on a, on a, a morning briefing uh, that it, it was an individual and he is in custody right now. Okay. He's out on bond he got out on bond uh, November 19th, but the vehicle, his ID in it, uh, 
I'm not saying that it is him, but that's who they're currently. Well, and I think a lot of this, you know, when you and I were kids and a lot of you watching this morning were kids back in the 70s and 80s, we had mental hospitals that kept people who were homicidal, suicidal, um, mentally ill uh, out of society. Now we're putting them in prisons. And I, I think about when I when I talk about this, I think of this one guy we had at the Sheriff's Department in Kurt, when Jeff and I were in corrections. And he was a like six foot four redheaded guy. He had a tattooed series of letters and numbers and, and symbols on his forehead and on his hands. And he, when he came in, he's like, officer Brown, you know what this is? And I said, no, he goes, it's the mark of the beast. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, I sold my soul to the devil. I'm like, okay, hmm, good to know. Well, one day he comes up to me and he's sweating and he's trembling. And he says, officer Brown, they're coming for me today. I'm like, who's that? you know, Lucifer and all his demons are coming to get me. And I'm like, okay, did you have your medication today? He's like, no. And I'm scared. I'm like, okay, let's do this. I'm going to try to keep the demons at bay. Let's go ahead and get in your cell. I'm going to shut the door and they can't get you in there. Cause I've put us, you know, I've prayed about it. And there's a thing around you. Anyway, whatever I had to do to get this big uh, crazy inmate in his cell and get him safe. And then we call the nurse and come down and get him his pills and his shots. And when I asked him, like, what did you do to get in here? And I looked it up in the system. You know what he did? He walked He uh, on Clinton Highway. He went to, like, Kmart or somewhere, took a brick and threw it through the window because he wanted to be arrested where he could feel safe, where he wasn't going to get attacked by Lucifer and these other spirits. These are mentally ill people, man. They, they need to be somewhere other than prison where they're preyed upon. This is a conversation we need to have in, in our country about the state of mental illness. And I think that maybe shutting down the mental health facilities in the 80s was thought of as a good idea, right? We don't want to just put these people. But some people, that's where they're probably the safest. What do you think? Well, I totally agree that, you know, these individuals, it, and it, it gets to a point where it's hard to distinguish which ones are legitimately have mental issues and which ones are just claiming that because of their criminal background. Mm -hmm. um, it could have been very easily for you or I to just become criminals and then sit back and go, no, it's because of my, you know, this and that of my ADHD or, you know, whatever mental insert mental health into it. And, and then trying to establish what is, what's the criteria of mental health versus for the criminal um, what is that level? Uh, one of the criminal law courses that we took, you know, was kind of focused on, you know, determining, you know, the, the mental capabilities of, of an individual based on the, that case in Texas uh, for mental handicap individuals to be prosecuted or they mentally handicap. Um, but when I see stuff like this, you know, it does not scream to me necessarily mentally handicapped, you know, and then, you know, you look at addiction um, and individuals that are under the influence of narcotics and, and, and how rampant that is these days, you know, it, you know, is, is it just an intoxicated individual that, you know, uh, but it, if I may, Looking at that and back to the defund the police issue, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of questions as far as how did this individual get through roadblocks that the law enforcement officers were supposed to be maintaining. Uh, in the video that I saw, this little girl is standing on the side of the road, you know, and I think if it was an, a targeted thing that there could have been a way more damage done. That's, that's where I have an issue of, you know, is it a criminal, you know, like, was it intentional? Like, was this, or was he like targeting an individual? Because he drove down the almost entire length of the parade, you know, actually almost dodging other people. The little girl was standing in the middle of the road and he passed her by feet, hmm. you know? So if he was like just intending on wreaking havoc, he could have started way at the beginning of that freaking parade. Well, and this also speaks to the idea of everybody's uh, 
you know, the AR-15 is the, is the bit scary thing in the room, right? It's black, it's metal, it's, it looks aggressive. It has a pow. It has a bang. <laughs> but in reality, you know, like if a few hundred, I, I think, people are killed every year with an AR-15. In a country the size of ours, where you have 340 million people to say a couple of hundred people are killed by it, I mean, I think uh, deaths by automobiles are approaching 40,000 on average every single year. We're not banning automobiles. And when you look at people say gun violence, I mean, think about this, folks. I don't like using that term, and I really discourage it because we don't say rented truck violence when somebody rents a truck and plows through people in Central Park like they have, rents a truck in Nice, France, and kills, what, 80 or 90 people that are out enjoying themselves. We don't say that, but we say gun violence. Well, to your point earlier, you talked about people that were in the in the – in the correction setting that were justified homicide. These were good shootings, but, but you know, we got to let it play out and they don't can't afford bail. So they're stuck in there. Anyway, I say that because I saw ice T the, the rapper was getting interviewed recently and they were trying to corner him into saying, yeah, but guns kill people and, and these kind of things. And he was, it, the video was actually really good. He was pushing back pretty hard on it. And he says, well, you don't need a gun to kill people. Well, yeah, but it helps. He's like, no, I mean, you, you know, he didn't say this. I'm I'm saying it. Timothy McVeigh, oh, what, 168 people with some fertilizer and a rented rider truck. So this idea that you have to have a gun to hurt people if you're inclined to do so is just absolutely bonkers to me. Well, the, the, I, I made a post on Facebook about this of, you know, knife violence, you know, car violence, you know, uh, weightlifting, you know, equipment violence. I mean, and right, at, right after I posted that they had that guy running around in Norway or whatever with a bow and arrow. I didn't see that. And he, you know, wound up walking through the entire city just with a bow and arrow, just murdering people. And, uh, he, you know, he'd shot like so many people and there was like the law enforcement, you know, we're like, you know, cause there's no shots being fired. So where, where are you going? You know? So, and this guy was just walking around town just with a bow and arrow shooting people with a bow and arrow. It's like add bow and arrow violence, you know, to the, to the, the numerous list. <clears throat> but if, if, if I may kind of, you asked me about being hard to kill. And I, as we were talking just now, it reminded me of, you know, knowing your environment, uh, when we were in corrections, we started because Rich and I have both, you know, done numerous martial arts and we started thinking about what's our normal operating environment, a four by four cell, you know, or a six by six cell. That's where we're usually at. That's where we're usually in a confrontation. What type of martial arts or, you know, we started kind of picking and choosing what type of martial art technique worked better in confined spaces. And we started developing, you know, our own fighting skills for a correctional environment that you only have this much space to, to maneuver in. And, and so I, I started thinking about that and knowing your environment that you're operating in, you know, obviously, you know, if you're in a maritime environment or you're in a, you know, big open field environment or urban environment and stuff like that. Just knowing your where you're at and how to move and and operate in that environment. That's a great point and and one that we'll probably I guess end on because I want you to think about this. I was watching a show of to your point about because it goes to cultural awareness. It goes to the language that people speak, the way they dress, the, the environment that you're in, how likely are you, you know, it, and it kind of falls into the whole gray man area. Everybody thinks the gray man is, you know, you've got a hoodie on blue jeans or whatever. Well, that may be the gray man, or it may not be. If you're trying to be a gray man in a hospital setting, you want to have on scrubs and maybe a lab coat or something like that. And, and then you're going to blend right in. If, if you want to be the gray man on a construction site and you're wearing your hoodie and your jeans and your backpack, you're going to stand out. You want to have a safety vest on and a hard hat. 
maybe, I don't know, set of work boots. And, and so it, it really depends what your cultural context is. I was watching a thing the other day where I think it was Peaky Blinders and this guy, he's running, he jumps out of a window and he, he doesn't put his suspenders on. He puts the shirt on over the suspenders, buttons it up and runs out onto the street. And you can immediately see that every other actor on the set, you can see their suspenders, but you can't see his cause he throws his shirt on. And, and then, and then in the, the way the show played out, the cops couldn't see him. I'm like, this is BS. You stick out because you're not dressed like everybody else. Anybody in that 1920s Birmingham, England would have noticed there's something not right about this guy, the way he's dressed. And that's where like the, the book left a bang does a really good job of, of the combat hunters that go into these communities in the middle East have to understand what they're looking for. You and I may be in a market in Yemen and if we're with somebody that's there, it's like something's not right about this guy. Oh, why? Because you never want to hold a goat with your right hand. You would only do that with your left hand. But look at the way he's doing it. Notice nobody else in here is holding a goat. And why is he sweating? It's the winner, you know. To start putting those clues together and be able to project this into the future and say, this is not good. Something is wrong here. It's like Republic of Georgia. You don't toast with a beer in your right hand. You know, if you toast... A beer with your right hand it, it, it's bad bad luck it has to be with your left hand and to an enemy you know but little little things like that <clears throat> you know I, I've, I've i love researching that and finding out things like that about the different cultures that i go to yeah you need to jeff and i were talking the other day i've been to 20 something countries i think you've been to i don't know 40 or 50 which is kind of unusual for a, a group couple of hicks from east tennessee to have been that well traveled but in those journeys you know you get culturally sensitive to jeff's point you know working in a corrections environment where am i going to be fighting these in inmates at i'm going to be fighting a combative inmate in this little cell okay great what's here oh, there's hard services always to my right if i just entered the cell or whatever what's he got in his property box where is the property box stored Etc. So think about your environment, whether that's your work environment, the inside of your vehicle, the inside of your home, and take that 360 degree approach to your own safety and security. Scott says, great show, guys. It's good to learn more about Jeff. Respect both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you to the 16 folks that are currently still with us and to the 20 something that joined us live today and to everyone that will watch. Remember, we have Coffee with the Rich so you can watch all the previous shows that we've had for the past two years or so. Please check out the American Warrior Show podcast and all of our sponsors on the AmericanWarriorShow.com. Jeff, thanks for being on this morning, man. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Thanks, folks. Jeff, you want to take us out? Yep. Folks, remember, the fight is coming. Be ready.